Isaac, Israel, Hayes always imagined there should be more. I can picture him thin and trim, a tidy mustache, slightly receding hairline, and that sense of dissatisfaction that had begun to dull his emotions. He was, after all, a mere country physician in the rolling hills of Pennsylvania. And he had grown tired, cry, tired of the routine and the rhythm. Ah, that predictable rhythm that oscillates between a fever here, farming accident there, maybe the occasional birth. The only way that Hayes could escape his world was to inhabit another one, the one that exists on top of us. I'm not referring to heaven. You see, Hayes had become obsessed with the Arctic. He consumed and voraciously read book after book, tales of explorers and expeditions, captains courageous enough to tame the world. Oh, how Hayes wanted to be part of those stories. And so without much thought, he quit his country practice and enlisted to serve as a surgeon on a ship. Now, his first expedition was a rather audacious one. It was led by the captain, Elijah Kent Kane. After all, this was a golden age for people with three names. Kane had a dream. The idea that maybe there was an ocean at the top of the world. A sea of glass surrounded by snow nestled in the tundra. Sadly, Kane's expedition ended in tragedy when his men had to abandon ship and make a trek back to civilization in knee-high snow. 83 days they marched, a tortuous and arduous walk. But the unflinching doctor lost only one patient through all those travails. And when he returned to Manhattan, he was greeted by songs, lyrics, and limericks celebrating his bravery. Now, when Kane died a few years later, everybody knew that Dr. Hayes was going to pick up the mantle. He would become the next great American explorer. And so he spent four years, four years traversing the country, four years telling tales of toil and triumph, four years attempting to convince people that for a mere $30,000, they could have their name etched into history. After much arduous labor, finally, in July 1860, he departed Boston Harbor. He was serenaded by the loving songs uttered by longshoremen and the wincing and whims whimsical smiles of women waving their handkerchiefs. The first stop was Greenland, and then a treacherous trek, 20 days sailing north into the ice. Hayes had prepared for every eventuality. Crates of food lined the bow. Skis, axes, snow boots, every bullet, every blanket, every tool that would be needed to tame the tundra. Now when sailing became impossible, they disembarked and began to follow a path across the snow for nine weeks, driven by the dream. Oh, what wondrous routes for trade they would discover, what creatures they would find, what advances in science and cartography they would make. Ah, oh, driven by this, and by the madness that defines those people that dare to dream beyond their station in life, Hayes pressed on pressed on into an unforgiving landscape where ice had become so solid that bodies could no longer be buried. And then he heard it. Now, there's no way to know if it was night or day. He heard it faint at first, the sound of water lapping against the rocks. And he was there. Now, he couldn't see the other side of the shore. He couldn't cross. He couldn't etch the confines of the sea. That would have to be left for another explorer. And so languid and wearied, 
muscles tinging with tension, he turned around with a fire in his belly. The fire that comes from recognizing that upon his return, he would be greeted as a hero. So when he came back in the fall of 1862, something had changed. I can almost see him, wind-beaten, covered in pelts and polar bear skins. There are no songs sung by longshoremen, no handkerchiefs waved by women. For instead, these same women are now gla- clasping folded flags. The South had seceded. The Battle of Bull Run had been fought. Lincoln was on his second commander. And newspaper had no time to talk about the exploits of an explorer. The humble humdrum of home had made Hayes recognize that he was now inhabiting an alien landscape. There was one article, though, written about him. In a Detroit newspaper, it read something like this. Perhaps there's a continent up north, and perhaps there isn't. And maybe there's an inland sea, and maybe there isn't. But who will go there on a pleasure voyage? And who will go to fish trout? What Dr. Hayes has done has no practical importance on earth. So Hayes was left with only one option to find something practical and important to do. And he did for a while. He served as an army surgeon in a hospital in West Philadelphia. He became an assemblyman in upstate New York. But he never truly recovered his land legs. He was destined to live caught between memory and reality, between the past and the present, forever at sea, even on land. Now, friends, it strikes me that any one of us who has heard the call of the carpenter from Jerusalem, can relate to Hay's story. For we too are inhabiting a sliver of space that exists between the not yet and the nevermore. Adventists know this well. They know the reality of Christianity as a countercultural force. They know the pain of isolation and what it feels to be a pariah. Adventism could be aptly described as a novella, one that effortlessly fuses anxious expectation with disappointment. Now, our founders were fabulous men and women who were buoyed by the promise of the parousia, who were baptized in disappointment tears, and who were emboldened through cornfield visions. This gave them the strength to escape the confines of New England parochialism and establish a worldwide movement that continues to be a blessing to the world. But our experience hasn't come without challenges. Like I said before, we all know what it means to be isolated. Uh, Listen to the words that that Adventist founder of old, William Miller, writes in December of 1844, trying to explain how exiled Adventism has become. He writes, It seems as though all the demons from the bottomless pit were loosed upon us, The same ones who were crying for mercy two days before now mixed with the rabble, mocking and scoffing in a most blasphemous manner. Oh, Adventism knows well the reality of inhabiting these liminal spaces. And so today, 
as we are suffering with social distancing, as we are inhabiting the space of isolation, we turn to Scripture. We turn to that most Adventist passage of them all in order to try and glean some answers, a pathway to redefine our identity and to hear the voice of God once again. I am, of course, referring to Revelation in the 14th chapter. And so if you have a Bible, I'd invite you today to open it with me to Revelation 14. Now, a bit of context might be helpful. For if we truly want to dialogue with the prophet from Patmos, it might be helpful for us to know what he is trying to accomplish. The gifted writer that he is, he has elevated the dramatic tension in his book to unbearable heights. The sound of the seven trumpet is still ringing in our ears. And now the seer may, must make a decision. Either he constructs a climax or he navigates a respite in order for the hearers and the readers of the book to catch our collective and expectant breaths. So to be sure, Revelation 14 serves as a parenthesis, an attempt at breaking the isolation station enacted by Roman rule. It is a message that is intended to proclaim boldly that God can and will protect his people. And so he begins. He begins with a grammatical construction that has become one of his favorites. It is the way in which he always introduces a new vision. Revelation 14.1 reads, Then I looked. And there before me. This particular construction has appeared throughout the book for a whopping 26 times. And it's almost as if the revelator is attempting to invite us to witness, to catch a glimpse, a glimpse of what God is up to. Now, every time we see this construction, our mind immediately goes back to the beginning of the book. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, when John is introduced to us in the third person as the one who bears witness, witness to the word of God, witness to the testimony of Jesus, and witness to all the things that have happened. And so, at the very outset of this parenthetical chapter, the author is trying to have us understand something. John is not a composer. He's a conduit. I've often wondered how my religious life would be impacted if I lived it with that philosophy. What if instead of attempting to compose the rhythm and the rhyme of my existence, I decided to serve as a conduit for Christ? What kind of man would I be? And what kind of world would I forge? Ah, but I digress. For John has seen something. Now let's get back to it. Let's go to the second half of verse 1 in chapter 14. And there before me was the lamb. What did John see? He saw a lamb. Now, I should note that John chooses to use the definite article in conjunction with the noun lamb. He does so in order to evoke a stark contrast with Revelation 13. You see, that pericope is populated by beasts devoid of definite articles. Ah, John is using grammar to create a theological point even before he has told us a story. But grammar 
is not the only gizmo in John's theological toolbox. The idea that the beast, although a formidable antagonist, ultimately is left defenseless and inferior to the lamb, follows through. But as I said, that isn't the only tool in his toolbox. For he will press his case visually. Can you see him? There he is, the lamb, and he is standing. Ah, the same lamb who in chapter 12 was snatched up and taken up to the throne of God now stands. He is on his feet, standing strong against the claims of lordship and to lordship made by Rome. And it's almost as if the world for a second pauses. And we escape the liminal spaces that we inhabit, the isolation stations that we dwell in, and we get the faintest of glimpses of God's reality. The Lamb is standing, and He is standing for us. Ah, the world, that world that groans for redemption, is now ready to chant, uh, to sing a new song. And John has told us who the choir is going to be. Keep reading with me, and let's discover it. And with him, 144,000 who had his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like a roll of thunder and a peal of rushing waters. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure, and they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So what is needed to sing the song? Ah, well, the cadence of its rhythm can only be understood by those who parade with Christ on the eschatological battlefield. What makes these 144,000 God's elite force? What guarantees their status as sealed and saved? Is it doctrinal certainty? Or is it orthodox purity, maybe? Well, no. No. John tells us right here that what makes them different is that they follow the lamb wherever he goes. Maybe as you're staying in your house and as you're rediscovering relationships with your family, as you're touching base with people whom you love, maybe it's time that you recommit yourself to follow the lamb wherever he may go. The great Old Testament theologian and American prophet Amos Wilder says that our visions, our stories, and even our utopias are more than just aesthetic. They seek to engage us. Ah, John. John, that poet from Patmos, is also a master rhetorician. Wait a second. My son found out this week that I was going to preach, and he told me, Daddy, you are always using these really big words. So, Micah, just for you, rhetorician means somebody that talks a lot, kind of like your dad. This master rhetorician seeks to make us participate in a vision of God's reign. But even as we are participating, he is also looking to persuade us, to persuade us to act justly. 
John's call blissfully interweaves participation and persuasion in a beautiful panoply of symbolic language that is intended to provide comfort and hope, particularly in times of loneliness and isolation. And this symbol continues, for the only response that human beings can have is to look up to heaven. And once we do, there we see it. Revelation 14, verse 6 says that again, John saw another angel flying in midair. And the language is intended to remind you of what the seer has penned in chapter 8, verse 13. In that particular passage, it is an eagle who is flying in midair. And in both these cases, the purpose for flight is to declare warnings. You see, too often we are consumed with revelation, enamored with the imagery, obsessed with who is going to make it in and who is going to be lost. But you see, John is a stubborn optimist, one who believes that the purpose of prophetic speech is to call us to repentance. Never forget that this angel who is about to deliver the first message is attempting to have us repent and reconnect with our Creator. But the angel has something. He possesses something. John 14, 6 tells us that he had the everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who live on earth. If you're an original listener or reader of the book, you would have known well about gospels. A new emperor had just ascended to the throne in 69 AD. That year was the year of the emperors, four monarchs struggling to become number one, in quick succession falling. And so when finally Vespasian takes possession of the empire, he promises the gospel. He promises good news. And good news is enacted with a summarious judgment one that is meted out by Roman courts intended to punish unjustly anyone who would challenge their, no- their notions of cultural supremacy. Oh, they know about gospels and they know about judgment. Now notice, notice that then the angel speaks. He says, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Fearing God. Now, I know that a lot of times we struggle with that phrase, don't we? But what John is trying to say is that the fear of God must come from a faithful focus on Him as our eschatological judge. You see, Jesus is the end time judge. It is not my decision or my choice to define who makes it on the boat and who doesn't. Because in the end, it all belongs to him. So fear God and bring him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. It's interesting that the term hour of judgment has come is in past. The tense is a past tense. The Greek calls it aorist. Aorist indicative, to be more precise. This is to refer to an event that happened in the past and that is a statement of fact. Now, most scholars would tell you that what is is going on here is John is engaging in prolepsis. And this is nothing more than to speak about future events with such a certainty as though they already happened. Oh, how I wish I could have that faith to speak about distancing and isolation as nothing but mere memories. Now, God is still working with us. But as we think of the judgment, it, will, it would also do us well to remember that everything that happens in chapter 6 on, and particularly in chapter 14, verses 6 through 19, comes from the hand of the Lamb. It must be read and interpreted from the viewpoint 
of the gospel. The great Old Testament theologian Jacques Ellul gives us a particularly poignant phrase that helps us understand this text rich in Old Testament language. Elul writes, all is situated in the cross of Jesus. These texts must not be written themselves, but only in relationship to the love which sacrifices itself for those who hate it. Uh, You want to talk about judgment? Let's talk about it. If the cross is the world's judgment on God and his son, then, then the empty tomb is the father's verdict on the son and on the world which the son came to die for. It all begins with the cross. And moments of difficulty, challenging times, provide a poignant opportunity to reorient ourselves towards the cross, to capture its very essence in the messages that we share, to imbue our theology which is with its richness. Oh, John isn't done, though. He is telling us the good news. You see, the whole idea of Roman jurisprudence is that the judge needs by nature to be impartial. And John is telling you that when read through the lens of the gospel, the judgment is good news because the judge is on your side. He loves you. And so again, a second angel emerges and begins to cry out, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Fallen, fallen is the city. Again, he refers to this in aorist indicative. Even if Rome and its power continue to loom large, John has no doubt that the systems and the structures of men will one day give way to the reign of God. Fallen and fallen is Babylon the great, which has made all nations drink of the maddening wine of her adulteries. And again, John is trying to connect us with a picture, a picture that happened long ago. John is allowing us to recognize that Babylon by itself cannot create. It cannot conjure up any truth. It might co-opt some realities, but Babylon always leads to confusion. And in this particular passage, Babylon is being compared and contrasted with Lady Wisdom, the one we find in Proverbs chapter 9. In that passage, she too is mixing wine. She is kneading bread, and she invites us to drink from the wine and to eat the bread. And the cup of Lady Wisdom Will, be, will bring an enhanced spirituality, a deeper notion of who we are in relation to God. Babylon? Babylon's wine only breeds confusion. It allows us to participate in a drunken and maddening race. This manic need to consume and to be prosperous Well, we will give away every liberty that God has gifted us with, every gift, every pleasure from above, our peace and our very sense of self in order to accommodate a system that continues to promote self, selfishness. John will have us live in another world. A world where even suffering, even moments of isolation and disease have meaning. Listen to the words of New Testament scholar Eugene Boring as he writes, Apocalyptic thought gives experienced suffering a meaning. 
and it does so by placing it in a cosmic context. It's functioning here as hermeneutics of the present and not speculation of the future. What in essence, Boring is trying to have us recognize is that prophetic language finds a middle ground. Much like Dr. Hayes and the Adventist pioneers of old, prophetic language is able to dig a niche. And in that niche, it inhabits a space. One that finds the middle ground between panic and complacency and replaces it with Christian promise. There's something about human beings, something that yearns and desires to look back into the past. And as we look back into the past, our past coalesces with new language, new concepts that we form in order to describe our current reality. We've seen that John has done it. He does it by reaching back into the treasure trove of wisdom, which is the Old Testament. But this skill is one that is not exclusive to prophets or theologians. For today, in 2020, it is being employed by doctors, scientists, pastors, and even politicians. Words like social distancing, stay at home, and flattening curves crudely strewn together, together would have meant nothing but a, few years ago, but a few years ago. Yet today, today they describe this reality. One in which you are huddled together much like the Johannine community of Revelation listening, listening to a word of hope. Which is why the story of the pandemic of 1918 is so peculiar. You've heard it, undoubtedly, on the news. As people intend to draw some parallels between our experience and that which happened over a century ago. The Spanish flu infected around 500 million people worldwide. 50 million lost their life. And what was particularly brutal about that bout was that the age range that was most severely affected were people whose ages oscillated between 20 and 40. So think about it, my friend. The flu comes to your town and it devastates your community. But not only that, it begins to systematically eat away at the very fabric of society. And in the midst of this pandemic, in 1918, a group of New Yorkers decided to break any protocol of social distancing in order to, of all things, go watch a movie. Charlie Chaplin had debuted his new film, a story about a soldier desirous to become a hero. They packed that theater on that evening. After the movie had ended, the theater manager penned a beautiful letter in the newspaper thanking New Yorkers for their bravery. A few months later, he would be dead. And I surely thought that after that experience, 50 million dead, 500 million infected, a disease that does not care about your social status or your political agenda, I would have thought 
that the world had changed. Which is why it's so interesting that the 1920s came and went and went with but a hint and a subtle mention of the Spanish flu. I went to the store last week and saw two people fighting. First they fought over bottled water, and then they began to fight over toilet paper, and now they're fighting over hair clippers. The world has lost its collective mind. We inhabit a space of panic. My friend, we inhabit a tumultuous and terrible time. My mind immediately thinks about that poem written by the great Irish poet, poet William Butler Yeats. It's called Second Coming. It is a perfect picture of this panic-driven world that we are living in. Yeats writes, Round and round the widening gyre. And the falcon cannot hear the falconer. And all things break apart, for the center cannot hold. And anarchy is loosed upon the world. We're living in a period of anarchy. But we'll come out. This will end. We will be back in houses of worship. We will be back in restaurants and movie theaters. My prayer is that we won't be back to complacency. That we replace complacency with Christian promise. That we celebrate our freedom by following the Lamb wherever He may go. That we begin to read and study Scripture in the light of the Gospel. That we allow the cross to continue to guide us. That we replace fear. For my friend, good news has come to your house today. The judge is on your side. The judge is on your side. May God richly bless you until we meet again.